the Taste of Chicago began today, and people are not just talking about the food and the fun, but they're also talking about violence. If you're coming from the north or northwest side, the line stops here at the Chicago Avenue Brown Line Station. Passengers can then exit and board onto the shuttle buses that bring them into the loop. Commuters here in Chicago are not looking forward to the CTA's renovations on the red line. It will be closed in the spring from Chinatown through 95th Street. Even though today's most talked about event on campus may be Festival ISU, the University Program Board has many other activities and events to offer throughout the semester. Many people in McLean County are not so excited with this news and they were hoping that Mitt Romney was going to take the W. Reporting for TV 10 News, I'm Alexis McAdams. Now joined by our guest, Eric Rankin, who's a professor in government and politics here at ISU. Mr. Rankin, how did you think the debate went last night? Uh, overall, it was actually, uh, it was a good debate. One victim said that she received no assistance at all from the Chicago Police Department in retrieving her lost cell phone. Reporting from downtown Chicago, Alexis McAdams, Fox Chicago News. Normal firefighters responded to an incident at a home on the 500 block of Broadway on November 26 at around 10.30 p.m. Seven ISU students who live at this address were watching Monday Night Football when they were caught off guard by the sound of their carbon monoxide detector. We ended up calling the fire department and then they came and they went in the basement and they had like their carbon monoxide detector and they said it was at 180, which like at 35 is when you start getting dizzy and stuff. So they told us that we had to leave immediately because it was a deathly high level. Officials say a flu pipe in the basement broke, allowing carbon monoxide to flow in at dangerously high levels. Residents immediately evacuated safely thanks to their alarm detector. We heard the beeping going on because it was in the room right over there and uh, me and three of my roommates were home. And then I came downstairs and we were like, what do we do? So we all called our parents and uh, my mom said you should go ahead and call the fire department. The house is currently under ownership of Young America Realty. The residents said that the realtors had not installed any carbon monoxide detectors. This house had only one carbon monoxide detector thanks to a victim's mother who had to install it herself. We all thanked her for pretty much saving our lives. The residents did not realize the severity of the situation until the news hit home. It didn't hit me until the next day when my mom called me and she was like crying, like all worried and stuff. I was like, wow, it's, it's got to be serious. After this near-death experience, the boys want everyone to install a carbon monoxide alarm. I would tell everyone to get one. Every time I've been in an apartment now, I'm always like, do you guys have a carbon monoxide detector? Because it's pretty scary knowing that when we went to sleep, we couldn't have woken up. Thank God for that one carbon monoxide detector, though. The carbon monoxide alarm in this home behind me is what saved seven ISU students' lives the other night, proving that their mother knows best. Reporting for TV 10 News, I'm Alexis McAdams. In the investigation of three-year-old Robbie Kramer, who died Tuesday after suffering multiple blunt force injuries, there is now a 23-year-old man who has been charged with the beating death of the three-year-old. Yesterday afternoon, uh, the state's attorney's office uh, filed in a warrant for uh, Nicholas Compton's arrest on three counts of first-degree murder and one count of aggravated domestic battery. Uh, that, that warrant carried a bond of a million dollars with it. Compton is said to be the caregiver of young Robbie and was supposed to be taking care of him near the time of death at the Cambridge address. The suspect, Anthony Compton, has a criminal record and was convicted before for domestic battery in relation to a July 2011 incident with a woman here in Bloomington. Three-year-old Robbie Kramer lived here in Normal on Cambridge Street, right in this blue house behind me. It seems like just a regular quiet neighborhood, but neighbors told me off camera that the people that lived in this house with Kramer were not the best neighbors. They said there was a lot of erratic activity going on every night, lots of screaming and yelling. Pit bulls lived in there as well with the young boy who lived in the basement. On a street where there's not many children and it's usually calm and quiet, neighbors were surprised about the death of young Robbie. No kids or anything like that on this block. It's all retired people and yeah, older, older pe people. So yeah, that doesn't come. <laughs> this is this is kind of a shock to the neighborhood. Yes. The normal police department is investigating further into how and why Robbie was beaten. Oh, well, our investigation at this point is certainly is not over. I mean, we will continue to do um, an, uh, in interviews. We'll also continue to do follow up. Uh, we'll then continue to work as we have been with the coroner and the state's attorney's office to compile the best pace, case possible. I'm here at the normal police station where I spoke with Chief Rick Bleichner. He told me today that Nicholas Compton, 23 years old, who was the caretaker of Robbie Holmes, has been charged with three counts of murder and one case of domestic battery. He also told me they're not taking this case lightly and that Compton will be seen in court, but they're not sure of the date yet. Reporting for TV 10 News, I'm Alexis McAdams. Aviation enthusiasts in Bloomington traveled back in time and took a ride on the Tin Goose, 
a restored 1929 Ford Trimotor Airliner, last Thursday at the Central Illinois Regional Airport. Passengers were able to tour the world's first mass-produced airliner and took a ride on a unique flying machine that changed the way people traveled in America. I'm standing in front of a big piece of American history today. It's the 1929 Ford Trimotor Airplane, and it'll be here in Bloomington giving the residents an outlook from above. I got a chance to take a ride on this airliner, which looked, sounded, and felt like a piece of vintage machinery. Bob Rex wrote, a retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army understands the importance of preserving pieces of history like this Ford Trimotor so that everyone gets a chance to experience the magic. It makes me think that people do preserve things that need to be, and this is one of them. And I think it's great that Ford Motor Company built it, but I think, I think a lot of Ford Motor Company. The president of the local chapter of Experimental Aircraft Association, Linda Dornbaus, took part in bringing this airliner on a tour to over 15 different cities, including Bloomington, to allow the community to fly back in the past. We want to, people to understand our organization and plus to be able to fly a bit of history is pretty neat. Um, Executive Vice President of Country Financial Steve Denault said that his aviation adventure took him out of Bloomington and back in time. It takes you right back to 1929, exactly where this, you know, came out of. This is the introduction of commercial aviation, so you really are stepping back uh, in time. It's, it's loud, it was nice and smooth, you had great visibility, everybody has an aisle seat, everybody has a window, and it, it, it truly is a step back in time. The Ford Trimotor and a regular commercial airliner have some major differences. Some differences that make it more of a challenge to fly on. But pilot Tom Leahy said there are also some benefits. I'm retired from an airline and I've flown uh, large corporate or, and commercial jets for most of my life. And I still really migrate back to this type of equipment. It's a little more difficult to fly. It takes, uh, doesn't take a lot more skill, it just takes more muscle, I think, and a little experience. But the visibility in this airplane is great, uh, sometimes too good on a hot, sunny day. Reporting for 10 on 10, I'm Alexis McAdams. Coughing, sneezing, having a fever, or having the chills are just some of the symptoms of having influenza. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 47 states are now reporting high levels of flu-like illnesses. Illinois State University is just one of the many campuses that are affected by the flu virus around the nation. And Illinois State University Student Health Services is taking the proper precautions to stop the spread of the sickness. For students, they are free. We are funded by student fees and we believe very strongly that we want students to be immune um, so that they're healthy and can perform well in classes, so we offer the flu shots to our students for free. You may be thinking that it's too late to get your flu shot now, but that's not true. No matter when you get the flu shot, you still better your chances of beating out the sickness by 92%. Many ISU students are taking advantage of getting the free vaccination and know that it's better to be safe than sorry. If you're in a class with somebody and you know they're sick and they still come, I'd rather know that I have a flu shot uh, and I won't most likely get a specific strain of the flu versus sitting in a class wondering the next day, oh, am I sick? With the spread of the flu virus going all over the nation, it's not a surprise that it's hitting here at ISU as well. I spoke with the ISU Health Promotion and Wellness Center this morning. They told me that the number one step that students here at ISU can take in preventing the spread of the flu is washing your hands. Washing your hands with soap and warm water for about 30 seconds is the best trick to stopping the flu virus and the spread of bacteria. Reporting for TV10 News, I'm Alexis McAdams.